mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance <laughs> that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Please rise and hear the call to worship. <clears throat> A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Let us worship the Lord by singing, Worship the King. <clears throat> God, you are our maker, our redeemer, and yes, even our friend. And we rejoice for this is the day that you've made. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us here. May we turn for a moment to you and focus upon your word, your truth, the power, the strength, the eternal one, our faithful one, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray all these things. Amen. Let us read responsively the confession of sin today. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, 
We have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. Apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises. Declare to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May God Almighty grant you true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us continue to worship in song. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> The Lord does supply every need that we have. And we come to the time of the offering. If you're visiting with us here today, please just let the plate pass. But we do have out in the narthex near the front door uh, prayer request forms. And if you want to receive any emails of upcoming events, um, please fill that out. And you can just uh, leave it with myself or one of the other um, officers. So may the ushers come forward for the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Please rise for the doxology. Almighty God, Lord, we thank you for giving us everything that we dare hope or imagine. You give us exactly what we need, and we need more of you each and every day. May you, Lord, take these gifts, these offerings back and, Lord, multiply them so that many can become your ambassadors for Christ. And throughout the entire world, we pray and praise you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. So yesterday, Rachel sent out that song, and it made me think of a, a passage. I know it's from Psalm 13, but um, I thought of a different psalm. I think that this, <laughs> this longing for how long the Lord is throughout scripture, so it's not uh, odd to find it in another place, but um, I'll read from Psalm 90, starting at verse 10. It says, The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and the wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord. How long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glories and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord be 
our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do ask, how long, O Lord, how long until you come again, until you make all things new? Lord, we look forward to that day where we recognize that your word tells us and we even in our own experience understand that life is full of toil and Lord, it is hard at times that there are many things that cause us trouble in this world. And yet, Lord, we don't lose hope because we have a gracious Heavenly Father who gives us the grace that we need day by day. Lord, not only do you understand our pain and our struggle and our toils from afar, but Lord, in, in Christ, you came. You took on human flesh. You suffered with us. Lord, you know what it is to be human you know what it is to live in this world, to suffer the indignities of injustice, uh, the pains and the toils that are put upon us. So, Lord, we know that you, we know that you understand us, Lord. We know that you care for us. We know that you do not leave us alone. And even though in this world we will have struggle, we will have toil, we take heart because you have overcome the world. And so, Lord. Even though we ask how long, we ask how long with hope. And so, Lord, we ask that you would uh, bless the work of our hands as we go through this life. Even as a church, Lord, this morning uh, in, this wor in this psalm, you've even told us that, um, that you satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. So, Lord, this morning, would you satisfy us with your steadfast love as we gather together as your people to worship you, to sing praises to you, to hear your word, to have fellowship with one another. Lord, would you use these things to set, satisfy us and strengthen us for the week ahead? Lord, we know that many in our congregation are still in need of um, prayer for specific things. And Lord, we continue to pray for Roger and his healing, and I pray for Cheryl and her healing as well. Um, Lord, we pray for uh, Carl. Pray for the for Don and Sue and their family. Lord, we pray for uh, the many who have uh, lost loved ones and continue to uh, miss them day by day, moment by moment, waiting for the day when you will restore all things. Lord, our church is continuing to um, seek the man that you have for our pulpit. Lord, would you give us success in this task? Uh, and each of the people who are involved in the process, Lord, would you strengthen them day by day? It's been a lot of work, a lot of meetings, a lot of time. And we thank you for their service. And pray, Lord, that you would just strengthen them for the tasks ahead. Lord, we pray that um, you would be with uh, Bob this morning as he brings your word. We thank you for him. Thank you for preserving him and healing him, even in the midst of the many um, surgeries and struggles and, and trials that he's had. Lord, I think we can all attest that despite these things, Lord, uh, we know that your grace and your mercy is new every morning, that you are faithful, and we're thankful. And that's why we gather. We gather to rejoice, to give you our thanks and our praise. So be with us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good, morning. good morning. It's good to be with you this day on this Lord's Day. And uh, I want to thank you for your, your prayers on my, my behalf. I'm teaching you all how to pray. Um, <laughs> But uh, a little over a week ago, um, I was all ready to start cardiac rehab, and I was sitting at my kitchen table, and my chest tightened up, and it hurt really bad, and I had trouble breathing. It was all the classic signs of a, of a heart attack. So I ended up in Abington Hospital, and uh, I, I had a heart catheterization 
as you might recall, back in February where they opened up my LED left interior descending artery, the Widowmaker. I have four stents in there and that midsection was all clogged up and they opened it up and uh, well, uh, apparently one of the, um, the stents uh, had what's called a re -stenosis. It closed up again. It closed up again and uh, I was on the verge of, of a heart attack. And, uh, and so they, uh, they did another heart catheterization, my 29th. Uh, even my doctors are impressed I've had so many. Uh, 29 heart catheterizations. And um, they couldn't get the catheter through the blockage, which is not good because uh, they don't want to do open heart surgery on me because that would be my third open heart surgery and each one gets a little, little riskier. So they used a special catheter with a special tip on it. And it sounds so delicious. It was called a chocolate balloon. Doesn't that sound lovely? <laughs> a chocolate balloon. And so I, I asked the, uh, the uh, cardiologist who did my, my catheterization, I said, what is that? And he kind of chuckled. He says, well, it's a high velocity catheter and it has little micro razor blades on the end. So it literally is like rotor rooter you know, cleaning out my, my valve, not my valve, my, uh, my, my heart. So they, they open up the, um, the stent and then they put another stent inside the stent. So there's a stent in the stent, which, which is amazing they can do. So I have five stents. So I'm doing okay, a little, little tired, a little sore. I see my cardiologist uh, Tuesday and then the following week I see my pulmonary doctor because I, I have a new diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension that still needs to be addressed and kind of looked at and figured out how we're going to proceed with that. But thank you for your prayers and, and uh, it's good to be here. Uh, this is a whole lot better than Abington Hospital and uh, good to see all of your, your friendly faces. Well, we want to get into the Word. My, my wife, Marcia, didn't come today. She's at her home church. Uh, she wanted to see a, a, a girlfriend of hers whose daughter, who's in her 30s, we've, we've known uh, Noelle since she was born. And um, it's a non-malignant tumor in the center of her brain. It's a, something, I think it's called a colloidal cyst. I could be getting that wrong. Um, it's not malignant. However, it, it does grow and it may not be operable, and it does cause uh, debilitation. It does uh, interfere with, with function, brain function. So anyway, Marcia wanted to talk to Debbie, her, her friend, and, and just uh, uh, see how Laura, uh, not Laura, Noel made out. She saw the uh, neuro neurosurgeons Friday. So, but Marcia told me, please, please tell everybody hi um, and give them, give them all my best. And uh, hope, Lord willing, she'll be here next time I'm here. Well, we want to look into the Word of God this morning. We want to turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And the message is entitled, A Blind Man with 2020 Vision. A Blind Man with 2020 Vision. We want to, we want to look at uh, Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus. So Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Mark chapter 10 verses 46 to 52. Now Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's, uh, this is right before uh, the triumphal entry. It's, it, it, within a week he's going he's to be crucified. And uh, so he's going from Jericho to Jerusalem. And so look in verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. May the Lord bless his word. Let us pray. 
Father, we thank you that you and your goodness saw fit to include this, this episode in, in the word of God, our word, the, your word to us. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can look at the life of Bartimaeus. We can look at this episode. And, Lord, it teaches us a lot about Bartimaeus, his faith, how he viewed you, how he lived his life. But more importantly, Lord, it teaches us much about you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see, bless our hearts, encourage us. We pray that as we look into this portion of your word, that your spirit would comfort us, would encourage us, would even challenge us, and would change us. And we pray all this now in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, uh, this is not a trick question, but what is Bartimaeus' name? What is Bartimaeus' name? You're thinking, well, this is a trick question. He just said his name. Well, Bartimaeus is not his. We don't know what his name is. Bartimaeus, uh, Bar is an Aramaic word that means son of. Timaeus is the father of Bartimaeus. In fact, the scripture even says that they came to Jericho. He was leaving Jericho and a great crowd. And Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus. Bartimaeus simply means the son of Timaeus. So we really don't know Bartimaeus' name. You know, my, my dad's name is John. I'm Robert. So I would be in Aramaic. I would be Robert Bar John. In, in Hebrew, it would be Robert Ben John. Uh, ben would be the Hebrew word for son. So we, we don't exactly know his name, but we're just going to call him Bartimaeus. It's just a whole lot easier to refer to him in that way. And so Jesus is, is on his way to Jerusalem. He goes to Jericho. Remember in Jericho too, prior to this, uh, Zacchaeus comes to know the Lord. And Zacchaeus was the tax collector, and he has Jesus over for lunch. And, and uh, remember, he had this wonderful conversion where he gives half of his money to the poor, and the other half he uses to make restitution uh, to people that he stole, he extorted money from. Now, Jesus is leaving Jerusalem, or rather Jericho, on his way to Jerusalem. And Bartimaeus is by the gate, the gate leading out of the city. It's a main gate. It was where elders and, and uh, city officials and people would just, it was kind of like, uh, the, the first century Starbucks. It's where people would just gather and talk and, and chew over stuff. And it was a great place for somebody who's blind to beg because you had a lot of literally foot traffic. And so there is Bartimaeus and he's there, he's blind and Jesus is coming through and it says that he's with this great crowd and even though Bartimaeus couldn't see them, he heard them. And so he hears this, this buzz, he hears this, this great crowd coming toward him, coming toward the gate to leave Jericho. And so Bartimaeus, he turns to the people near him and says, what's happening? What's going on? And they say, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And then he gets all excited. You know, because he sat at the gate begging every day, he heard a lot about Jesus. This is the end of Jesus' public ministry. Three years have gone by. And, and uh, Jericho also was where the priests and Levites lived. It was kind of a suburb of Jerusalem, about 20 miles away. And the priests and Levites would go to the temple in Jerusalem. They would put in like a, a week's work. They would work a week as a shift working in the temple. And then they would walk back to Jericho. And that's where they lived. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. And remember the priests and the Levite, you know, just passed him by. Well, uh, this road to Jerusalem from Jericho was a road that priests and Levites would always be walking because they lived in Jericho, worked in Jerusalem. And so the priests and Levites, for three years, uh, they heard all about this Jesus. They had seen Jesus. They had heard Jesus. Perhaps they saw him heal people. And so here's Bartimaeus sitting at this gate for three years, the three years of Jesus' public ministry, and he hears all this wonderful stuff about Jesus. And he hears about his teachings. He hears what Jesus talks about being born again. Unless you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of, of, of heaven. He hears about how Jesus can forgive sins. He hears about how Jesus can heal, how Jesus can make you whole. He hears about how Jesus is the Messiah, or at least he claimed to be, the son of David. That he's the son of God, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. 
And so Bartimaeus heard all this stuff for three years, and now he's told that Jesus is coming through. And he gets real, real excited. Now, he can't see Jesus, and so what does he start doing? He just starts yelling out as loudly as he can. He starts saying, <laughs> excuse me, he starts saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And he does it over and over and over again, kind of like surround sound, because, again, he can't see where Jesus is. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, some of the people with him, they tell him to, to stop doing that. Now, I'm not quite sure why. Maybe they just thought it was kind of tacky to, to be hitting up a rabbi for money. Maybe they thought, you know, Bartimaeus was just hoping for a really good payday with Jesus. But they tell him in, in polite terms, they tell him to be quiet. In our terms, they tell him to shut up. They say, shut up, you know. But what does he do? He just disregards them. And it says that even more, he starts yelling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, over and over and over and over again. Now, the crowd is there. It's noisy. And he wants Jesus to hear him. So he is persistent. He's loud. And over and over again, he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then what happens? Jesus hears him. Look in verse 49. And Jesus stopped. He stopped. And he said, call him. Now, I would dare say that the moment that Jesus stopped, the crowd just got real silent, got real quiet. Because Jesus is about to do something. Because, you know, they're just walking through. They're on their way to Jerusalem. And, and they're just talking and conversing. But then Jesus stops. And he says to those around him, he says, call him. Again, there's a big crowd. Call him. And so they call to the blind man, they call to Bartimaeus, and they say to him, take heart, good news, get up, he's calling you. And what does Bartimaeus do? He stands up, he takes off his cloak, and he throws it from him. Now that's not too smart for a blind guy, right? He doesn't see where it landed. But he had faith. He believed that Jesus was going to do something spectacular. By the way, I brought the jacket that needs dry cleaning. <laughs> I was going to wear another one this morning, but I said, no, 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 I just got that dry cleaned. No offense, I don't know how clean your floors are. Um, but Barnabas throws off his jacket as a, as a declaration of faith. And now he can't see where Jesus is. And, you know, I know when I was a kid, we used to play a, a game called Green Light, Red Light. And, and they would say, take two baby steps, take three big steps. And I bet you the crowd just kind of guided him toward Jesus because he couldn't see where Jesus was. And they're guiding him to, to Jesus. And he's just kind of walking, you know, kind of tentatively walking to where Jesus is. And he comes right to where Jesus is. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus says, I, I, I want to see. I want my sight recovered. And then Jesus says, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight. And then this really just blows me away. He followed Jesus on the way. Now think about this. He was blind. He was blind, couldn't see a thing. And now Jesus restores his sight, and, and you would think that maybe he'd want to do some, sorry for the pun, sightseeing? He's got these new eyes. He wants to check things out. You know, he also needs to get a job. Up until then, he was completely dependent upon the goodness of people to throw money in his, in his cup. But instead of doing any of that, he follows Jesus. To Jerusalem. And just think about it within a week with his new eyes, he sees his Messiah. And when he cries out, Son of David, that's a messianic title. He knew who Jesus was. He identified Jesus as the Messiah, as the one promised by God. But within a week with his new eyes, 
Bartimaeus was going to see his Lord, his Messiah, his King hanging on the cross. Hanging on that cross. Well, this is a story of, of um, Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, a beggar who Jesus restores his sight to. And, and what does the Lord have for you and myself? There, there are some takeaways I want to just kind of share with you. Uh, three having to do with Bartimaeus, uh, three having to do with our Lord, with Jesus. And, and uh, the three having to do with Bartimaeus are not mutually exclusive. They're all kind of facets of a diamond. They're all talking about the same, the same thing. But the first, the first takeaway that, that we learned from Bartimaeus is that, that what Bartimaeus believed about Jesus determined what he did. He believed that Jesus is his Messiah. He believed that Jesus could heal him. He believed that Jesus was the Son of God come in the flesh. He believed all this stuff. And so when he heard that Jesus was there, he got excited. And he threw his cloak off and went to Jesus because he knew and believed that Jesus could restore his sight. His belief about Jesus determined how he conducted himself, how he lived his life. And I tell you, there, there's a powerful lesson there for you and myself. You know, I, I've been to Bible college, I've been to seminary, I, I, I got my doctorate at Westminster, and I know a lot of theology, but I don't always live my theology all that well. I really don't. I know more up here than I live out in my life and my heart. You know, there's three truths about God that I especially kind of zero in on. Jerry Bridges wrote this really, really good book called Trusting God Even When Life Hurts. And he talks about these three attributes of God. One, God is totally sovereign. Two, God is perfect in love. And three, God is infinite in wisdom. And another way of saying that is, is that God knows what he's doing. And he knows what he's doing when he comes to my life. He's perfect in love. And the proof of that is the cross of Jesus Christ. And he's totally sovereign. God doesn't, you know, kind of get busy doing stuff in the universe and then turn around and say, oh, man, how did that clogged artery happen? You know, uh, that, that just kind of slipped by me. Bob, sorry, I'll do better next time. God is totally sovereign. And those are three truths about the Lord that I try to really focus and zero in on. And even though I know those things to be true up in my head, how often in my life do I still worry? How often in my life do I still fret and have anxiety and dwell on the land of what if? What if this happens? What if that happens? And how many times do I act as though I'm a spiritual orphan, that God is not my loving Heavenly Father, that He doesn't love me, that He's not for me, that I can't really trust Him for my future? Bartimaeus believed that Jesus is his Messiah. He believed that Jesus could heal him. Proof of that was throwing off his cloak and crying out to him and asking him to heal and give his sight back. He lived out his theology. And so the first challenge that, that we have from Bartimaeus is, I would encourage you, pray, say, Lord, I know an awful lot of stuff about you. I read it in the daily bread. I read it in the word. I hear it in messages on Sunday. I hear it in Sunday school classes. I know a lot about you. But Lord, let me really believe that in such a way that it informs and guides and directs and shapes my life. You know, I tell myself, I talk to myself, and you do too, you know, and we all do. It can be good self-talk or bad self-talk. Anytime you think, you're talking to yourself. But I try to talk to myself and remind myself of who the Lord is. And this is one thing I tell myself. I say, Bob, if you could really see God, if you could really see Jesus, if you could really apprehend him for who he is, you would not worry. You would feel pretty happy and upbeat about life. You'd feel pretty good about where things are going. That if you could really apprehend Jesus and see him in all of his grace and mercy and love for me, if I could do that, 
then I would not worry. I would not be afraid. I would not fret. I would not be anxious. But I feel pretty good about life and the things to come. So my prayer for me is, Lord, I know a whole lot of stuff about you. But help me to, to live that truth that I know to be true. Help that to take root in my heart and let me live my life in such a way that I reflect those truths about you. So that's the first takeaway we have from Bartimaeus, that he lived out his theology. He believed it and acted accordingly. And my prayer for you and myself is that we do the same. There's a second, a second takeaway from Bartimaeus. He was a beggar. And back in those days, there was no such thing as welfare. There was no such thing as Social Security, no such thing as disability income, no such thing as food stamps, no such thing as any kind of social safety net provided by the government. There was none of that. And he was totally and completely dependent upon the goodness and the kindness of people. And so here he hears Jesus is there and he starts yelling out over and over again, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. People around him tell him to shut up. But he just blows by them and yells out even more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. What Bartimaeus was doing is he was casting his lot 100% into, into Jesus. That these are the people he depended upon to, to give him money to, to buy food, to, to, to take care of his needs. If he offends these people, if they tell him to shut up and he just ignores them and blows by them and does what he wants to do, maybe they won't give him money. Maybe they just will cut off the alms that they would give him. But Bartimaeus was willing to risk everything for Jesus. Everything. He was willing to risk everything his safety, his security, his welfare for the sake of Jesus to see him. And that's a second takeaway that, that I, I take from Bar Bartimaeus, that I pray that, Lord, do I follow you and do, do what I do? Because Christianity in America, at least for me, is comfortable and nice. I mean, you're, you, you all look like nice people. I, th I think you are. If not, you do a good fake job. <laughs> but, you know, do I follow you, Jesus? Because to be a Christian in my context, in my life at this time, is nice, is enjoyable, is pleasant. But what if all these things were stripped from me? Would I be willing to still be sold out for you? Would I still be willing to serve you and live for you? Would I be willing to give things up for you? if I was asked to do so. And so Bartimaeus was willing to sacrifice and risk everything for the sake of seeing Jesus. And so I would again, as a takeaway from Bartimaeus, just say, Lord, help me to live and serve you sacrificially and be willing to give up everything and anything to follow you if I were asked to do so. And then a third takeaway. Out of love and gratitude to Jesus, Bartimaeus was willing to give up what he wanted to do to follow Jesus. Remember, he just got his sight back. And, you know, it'd be lovely to kind of, you know, walk around and travel around and just see all the things that he couldn't see. He heard about, he knew about, he experienced through other senses, but now he's got eyes, he can see all this stuff. He could get a job and start earning his keep. And you know, just a little sidebar, you know, remember Zacchaeus gave half of his money to the poor? I wonder, was like Bartimaeus going to get any of that? Because he certainly was poor. But what does Bartimaeus choose to do? He follows Jesus from Jericho into Jerusalem. He just wants to spend time with Jesus. He says no to what he wants to do, what we would think he would want to do. Check things out, travel around, see things, get a job. And instead, he just wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to deny himself and follow the Lord 
And again, the takeaway I have from that is, Lord, there's a lot of things in this world that call out to me, but let my heart always be completely centered and sold out to Jesus that I follow him and deny myself. You know, I was at a church uh, one time and there was a preacher from, from Camden and, um, and he said, you know, we, we, the Bible says, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus says that. And he says, listen, if you love singing in the choir, that is not taking up your cross. If you, if you love working in the nursery, that is not taking up your cross and following Jesus. A cross is an instrument of suffering and pain and hardship and inconvenience. He said taking up your cross and following Jesus is when there's something you really, really want to do. And you say no because you choose to do something for Jesus instead. You give things up for Jesus that's what it means to take up your cross and follow Jesus. You know, um, I've, I've enjoyed working at the mission for 35 years, 33 years as uh, the executive director. And, you know, sometimes people say, wow, you know, you really sacrificed and, and gave your life for Jesus. And, and I have to be honest and tell them, well, well, well no, I've, I've actually enjoyed it working here for 33 years and 35 years now. It hasn't been my cross to bear. It hasn't been. Now, my health, you could say, is my cross to bear. But I love the mission. I love doing what I do. That's not my cross. But there have been other things that I've been asked to do in ministry, apart from the mission. Coming here is not one of them. That, that has been my cross to bear. That I do not want to do those things. And yet I know it's something the Lord wants me to do, so I choose to do those things, even though everything within me doesn't want to do those things. So that's the third takeaway from Bartimaeus, that he denied himself, denied what really is, are not bad things, going around, checking things out with his new eyes, getting a job, earning his own keep. Those are not bad things. But the most needful thing for him he knew was to follow Jesus and to walk with him to Jerusalem. So those are three takeaways from Bartimaeus. And I want to share three takeaways from Jesus. And, and, and anytime we focus on Jesus, th this is the best thing that we can talk about. He's the best thing we can talk about. And the first takeaway that, that we have from this passage is Jesus just think about it. He's on his way to Jerusalem to die on the cross for your sins and for my sins. He's with this big crowd of people. There's a lot of stuff happening. And he hears this, this voice calling out persistently, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he stops. He stops everything. He's about to accomplish redemption for lost mankind. The greatest thing that, that would ever take place in the history of people. And he stops to take care of Bartimaeus. One person, one man, one individual. You know, the scriptures tell us that Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. You know, it tells us that he's our great high priest. And Jesus is the Son of God sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and, and he is God, a very God. You know, it's, to me, it sounds like a pretty busy job. And yet, what I find absolutely amazing is that if, when I'm lying in that hospital bed and I'm being given bad news, I can cry out to my Jesus. And in a sense, he stops everything to hear my prayers. And he loves me as though I'm the only person to love. And that's what I see in this passage, that Jesus stopped everything for Bartimaeus. And you and myself, we have the comfort and the consolation and the hope and the assurance that no matter what you're going through, that when you cry out to Jesus and come to him, that he's there and he listens and he loves you and he's for you. And he will talk and treat and deal with you as though you're the only person in the world that he has to care for. And that's what I love about my Lord, 
that he never says to me, like at a deli counter, take a number, I'll be with you in a moment. <laughs> He's always there for us. There's a second takeaway about Jesus, and that is that he cares about every part of my life. He cares about every part of your life. You know, for him to heal Bartimaeus, that was huge. I mean, he was a beggar. As I said, there was no social safety net to, to help Bartimaeus on his way. He was completely dependent upon the charity, the kindness of people giving him money. And so for Jesus to give him new eyes, to give him his sight back, meant that Bartimaeus could get a job. It meant that he could take care of himself. He could provide for himself. He could get better clothes. He could, he could have better food. He would have a place to live, a better place to live. He would not be dependent upon others begging every day, day in and day out. He would not be vulnerable and at risk for people to take advantage of him. And so this tells me that Jesus cares about every single aspect of your life and my life. He cares about your job. He cares about your employment. He cares about your finances. He cares about your health. He cares about your future. He cares about your present. He cares about your past and the hurts from the past. That Jesus cares about every single aspect of your life. You know, Scripture says in Hebrews 4 that he's our great high priest and we can come boldly to the throne of grace and receive help from our Lord. I just would encourage you that Jesus is always there for you. And he says he cares about the numbers, the number of hairs on our heads. I've made that much easier for him. And perhaps you have too. But if he cares about that little detail, he cares about everything in your life. Don't hesitate to go to Jesus about anything and everything. And, you know, he delights to give good gifts to his children. You know, there is a, a, a well-known Bible teacher, uh, C.I. Schofield, and he put together the Schofield Bible. And I went to Philadelphia College of Bible, and that was like at the time, uh, not so much anymore, but it was like the big Bible to use. And... Um, but I heard a story, which is a really tender and sweet story about Schofield. And uh, he lived in the early part of the, uh, the 20th century. And he told his friend, he said, um, I'm going to ask Father. He always called God Father. He said, I'm going to ask Father for one of these new horseless carriages, cars. Cars were just starting to come around. He says, I'm going to ask Father for one of these new horseless carriages. <laughs> And his friend said to him, whatever for? And he said, well, now this is a paraphrase. He said, they look kind of fun. And, and father likes to give children, his children, good gifts. And I think he might like to give me something fun to play with. And you know, I love the spirit of his heart. That he knew that his father would meet his needs, provide for his needs but would also give him some of his wants and delighted to give good and perfect gifts to his children. And that's what I see. That's what I see in this passage from Jesus, that he delights to give gifts to us. And then a third takeaway is this. Anytime you see a miracle in the Bible, anytime you see a healing in the Bible, anytime you see Jesus do something that, that benefits and blesses somebody. To me, it's a preview of things to come. You know, I don't, I don't do the movies too much anymore. Um, but when my kids were growing up, uh, many a time we would take our four kids and, and we go to the movies and, and um, you know, watch a movie. And they always have previews, things to come, right? Coming attractions. And I would turn to my, my kids and I would say, that looks really good. We're going to have to see that. And I'd be all excited. Well, anytime you see a miracle, you see something in the Bible. Uh, in this case, we see Bartimaeus getting his sight back. Anytime you and I see something like that, that is a preview of coming attractions. That's a preview of things to come. 
that Jesus one day is going to restore us to wholeness and to health in the new heavens and the new earth. In Revelation 21, uh, John says, that, Behold, I, I saw new heavens and the new earth. The old one has passed away. And it talks about what heaven will be like. And it says that there is no more pain, no more suffering, no more death, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more tears. All this bad stuff that you and I deal with as part of this fallen world, one day it's all done away with. And so when I see this story, this healing of Bartimaeus, it's a reminder to me that yes, Jesus cares about my health now, but there's a better day coming. This is like a preview of coming attractions. That one day, my heart's going to be made whole. One day, my health will be made whole. One day, the people that have gone on before me who know Jesus, I will see them again. And in the meantime, they're safe in the hands of Jesus, safe in the arms of Christ. And so the third takeaway from this passage is just simply this. This is a reminder to us that the best is yet to come. This is a coming attraction of what the Lord is going to do for you and myself in giving, making our bodies whole and bringing in the new heavens and the new earth in which all the bad things of this life are done away with and all things have become new. So friends, this is a, a great episode in the life of our Lord. Uh, one day we'll, we'll meet Bartimaeus and uh, we can hear firsthand from him uh, kind of an elaboration of what, what we read in this gospel account. But I would just encourage you that Jesus loves you. He's for you. And as a believer in Christ, you and I can have a great life now. But the best is yet to come. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for this passage. I thank you, Lord, for how you healed Bartimaeus and you changed his life forever. And Lord, I thank you that your promises to us in the gospel is that one day we will see you face to face. And in the meantime, Lord, through the rough times, the rough spots, you give us grace sufficient to keep on keeping on, to press on, to not lose heart. And Lord, I pray, even as I mentioned earlier in this message, Lord, help us to, to apprehend who you are, your love, your grace, your mercy. Help us to have a better understanding of who you are so that when we are faced with the bumps and bruises of this life, they don't throw us for a loop. They don't knock the wind out of us and, and cast us down. But Lord, we just keep on pressing on because we know, Lord, that if we could see and understand you as you really are, that we would feel okay and feel pretty optimistic that this is just something passing. It hurts, there is suffering, but that a better day is coming. And in the meantime, you will give us grace sufficient for what we're going through. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Lord, for the promises that we have yet to, to experience. And we pray all this now in your wonderful name, full of grace and love and mercy. Amen. Amen. Please rise and let's sing the last two songs. The praises now awake a dawn. We'll greet your mercy with a song. Your people stand and sing for all your love and
rescue us with arms outstretched upon the cross the greatest gift there ever was of love and kindness a life laid down to rescue us with arms Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The Lord be with you. Go in peace. Have a great rest of the Lord's day. Take care. <laughs>